Live from Fargo and serving you on TV, online, and on the go, this is Valley News Live at 6. We begin tonight with new information surrounding the nine-hour standoff yesterday in Moorhead, specifically about the man arrested. Police and SWAT team members were called to 1423 Fifth Avenue South after a domestic disturbance and a man possibly with a gun inside the home. 35-year-old Blake Fitzgerald eventually gave up and was taken into custody where he's facing domestic assault charge. You can see the house where Fitzgerald was holed up. Today, it's now boarded up. Most of the windows were broken as authorities tried coaxing Fitzgerald to surrender. He did, but not until authorities deployed tear gas into the home. Valley News Live's crime and safety reporter Bailey Hurley looked into Fitzgerald's past as well as the woman his family says is the reason for yesterday's standoff. Bailey? Mike, besides a laundry list of petty traffic violations, Blake Fitzgerald doesn't have a lot on his record that even resembles what went on yesterday in Moorhead. However, several of his neighbors I talked with tell me that Blue House on 5th Street is known for constantly having police at the door. I got a hold of dispatch records today which show since Fitzgerald and his ex-girlfriend moved in in January, Moorhead police have responded to the home 10 different times. One neighbor telling me the most recent incident was just last weekend when she woke up to five cop cars on her street and a woman yelling that her daughter was being held hostage inside that blue home. Now Fitzgerald family, Fitzgerald family tells me although he is to blame for some of his actions yesterday, they say his ex-girlfriend is the real person at fault. However, we're not using her name as police have not yet released it. Fitzgerald recently filed a no contact order against that ex-girlfriend after police records say she punched him in the face in mid-March. She was later charged with simple assault and resisting arrest. Now, both the women's family and Fitzgerald's family have confirmed to me that it was his ex-girlfriend who was at that home yesterday morning. Meaning, if that's true, she was in direct violation of that no contact order. Now, Fitzgerald was charged back in 2003 with terroristic threats and trespassing and has a domestic violence order against him out of Wisconsin. It's still unclear what exactly unfolded between the two yesterday morning before police were called, but most of those details are expected to be released tomorrow. Mike. All right, thanks so much, Bailey. Authorities say Fitzgerald will likely go before a judge tomorrow. He's being held at the Clay County Jail. An investigation is underway into a suspicious death in the Northern Valley. Authorities confirm that it's underway in rural Walsh County. The sheriff's office there says an adult female was transported to First Care Health Center in Park River, where she later died at the hospital. The woman has not been identified yet, in the, and the area where she was found is considered to be an active crime scene. A spokesperson added that the public should not feel threatened. We endured what seemed to be a never-ending winter, and now we're being challenged by a stretch of wet, windy, and gloomy weather. It sure would be nice if we were nearing the end. How about it, Hutch? Well, for tonight, more wet, gloomy, and windy weather is in store, although it's not too windy out there. Taking a look at the radar, though, the wet is certainly there. On the east side of the Red River, we have some showers passing uh, through uh, central and western portions of Minnesota and also more down in western uh, parts of our viewing area in Nelson County where you see the darker greens that's actually some heavier showers pushing into western parts of Grand Forks County and Walsh County not far from Grafton. So sprinkles still in the forecast for this evening. It does not look like heavy rain but more wet weather with temperatures near 40 degrees. Our by hour forecast shows our rain chances last until the deep overnight before finally wrapping out of here and in fact by morning possibly our western county seeing some sunshine, something we haven't seen in a little while. I'll have details on the rest of your forecast for Thursday here in just a few minutes, Mike. Look forward to that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We now know the name of the man of the body recovered of the Red Lake Reservation on April 25th. He's 26-year-old Dylan James Sayers. He was reported missing in late October of last year. He was last seen a week earlier when family members dropped him off at his home on the Red Lake Reservation. The body was recovered during a search east of Red Lake. The cause of death remains under investigation, but authorities say that those directly responsible for his death and any others who may have assisted and or concealed information will be charged accordingly. The city of Grand Forks is making its downtown more vibrant and leaders are looking for your input on how to get the job done. Valley News Team's Maddie Jelseth found out what some people say is needed the most. 
Just a little work downtown. They need a little bit of work, a little bit of life, some life. Van Sice recommends more concert or bands at Town Square, while others recommend more parking in the downtown area. That would be probably number one, and that would help out the retail businesses and, yeah, add to the downtown group. The Downtown Development Association of Grand Forks says the whole point of the Downtown Action Plan is to create a sense of community where everyone feels like they were part of making downtown, downtown. It's like what trees, what benches, what kind of lighting, but also about what they want to see in Town Square. Day-to-day -day use in Town Square was one of the biggest things the DDA said they heard in previous meetings. People want AstroTurf. People want a place for their kids to play, but also a place where they can comf comfortably hang out and be able to be part of that scene. Weber says the Town Square project is in the idea phase, with a lot of options on how it'll look. Weber also said the state DOT is funding 80% of the Downtown Action Plan project, and the rest of the money will be coming from the public. In Grand Forks, Maddie Jalseth, Valley News Live. You still have a little bit of time to put in your input during an action plan meeting, which is at the Downtown Development Association in Grand Forks. Downtown Fargo also has some big and bright changes coming its way. The eight-story Art Deco Black Building underwent its largest renovation since the 1930s. Well, tonight its brand new 30-foot tall sign will be lit around dusk. The Kilborn Group says the sign is to bring the spirit of the past back to the downtown area and to pay tribute to the original blade sign that once graced the face of the building during the 1930s and 40s. Today there's been a lot of attention and that's what we want. I mean, these signs are kind of a small piece of kind of creating this fun, vibrant downtown that's unique. We worked for the last couple of years on recreating the, the look and the dimensions and the size of the original sign. The Black Building was added to the National Registry of Historic Places and the Kilbourne Group is working to refurbish other historic details like the ornate elevator doors and terrazzo flooring. Eligibility standards have improved under a program that helps families cover their child's health care. The Division of Special Health Services says that today's 2.5% threshold increase is one of the larger such increases in recent years. A family of four that makes less than $48,000 a year is eligible for cost-sharing services. It helps cover care for more than 100 medical conditions like asthma or diabetes in children from birth to 21. The income threshold is raised every year, which allows more families to benefit from the program. Um, so it just helps them not have to worry so much about the expense and can spend more time dealing with their child and, and the needs that they need. There are about 2,000 families in this program statewide. And to find out more, you can call 701-328-4238. Minnesota officials say that they're going to be scrapping the troubled Minlars system for a packaged software solution after an independent review. The change over is expected to take about two years and will cost $73 million more to switch over. The move follows a near total failure of the beleaguered Minlars vehicle licensing system. Governor Tim Walls agrees with the recommendation saying that he's committed to fixing the system. The review says that while the recommendation is expensive in the short term and causes disruption with another changeover, it's the lowest risk path to a long-term solution. The total cost of the botched vehicle licensing rollout is expected to be at least $173 million.